parents buried their parents long before I was born. They buried their parents in Egypt, in their homeland. The only land they ever shared together. And when my parents left Egypt to come to this country, to begin a new life, they left their past behind. They left our past behind. I was born in Los Angeles without grandparents. And I spent every day of my life trying to get to know them, trying to get to know my ancestors. My ancestors feel very far away, thousands of miles away, oceans and deserts and mountains away, years and years and years away. My mother doesn't like to talk about her parents very much. They both died a year apart when she was 19 and 20 years old. And one of the only things she's ever told me about her father, my grandfather, was that he loved the latest fashions. While growing up, my mother told me that whenever her father had any extra money, he would buy himself some expensive garment. I think I'm a little like that. Actually, I'm a lot like that. I probably spend more money on clothes than I should. I use my love for fashion as a way to connect to my grandfather, to this man I never knew. One of the only photos I have of my grandfather is of him wearing the fez, or tarbush, as we call it in Arabic. There is this family portrait from the 1930s of my grandparents and their siblings and cousins, all my great aunts and uncles. And every man in that photo is wearing a fez. Tarbush, I mean. And when I put the tarbush on, I can feel them. I can feel my grandfather and all my great uncles and my distant cousins of the time. They never knew me. Through this fez, I can know them. In my own way. I have always known my color meant something. Always felt the weight of it. Felt the shift in a room, stumble of speech, subtle aggressions that never actually felt micro. It was taught. It was learned. It always was and is. But it seemed they knew I was black. A black that never really fit. Which is what I always really wanted to do. Especially when I brought that South African flag to Cultural Exchange Day. That didn't quite fit either. It just wasn't true. My dad looked at me, a little flag in my hands, and said, You're black, baby. Something to be proud of. You're the only one who gets to say what you are. And I heard it and slowly learned it. Learned that my black was completely different. Was defined by me and only me. Black with a capital B. Born and bred on buttered biscuits and booming stories of the South. Bred on bellowing laughter. Songs of pain and blissful possibilities. Capital B, Black Dad, Fort Benning Boy, boisterous and brolic. Capital B, Black Mama, beautiful and bountiful, who always served up Anita Baker Saturdays and all-day Gospel Sundays. Bred on cool minutes and hot seconds as units of time. Hot combs, relaxers, and those other things that attempted to buff out my capital B, blackness. To be capital B black is to be broad and brave and to blatantly defy a brutish world attempting to take your capital B, black breath. Never defined by flag or stare. Defiantly capital B black.
For my seventh birthday, my parents took me to McDonald's in Mexico. That place was expensive. I remember I got a Happy Meal and I felt like I was balling. <laughs> I got that Snoopy toy that was on TV. I swear, I felt like I had a celebrity toy. A meal there was almost 40 pesos. Now keep in mind that at that time I was always struggling to get three pesos so that I could get myself some Cheetos. So that was a lot of money. Three years later, my family and I moved to the States. As a 10 year old, I did not know a single word of English. I first lived in Paramount. And I swear, I saw Mickey D's at almost every corner. Everybody's wealthy here, <laughs> I thought to myself. My uncle invited us for lunch there and I was confused. But it's not my birthday, I told him. He laughed. We parked the car and we went inside. Everything was so new to me. I remember a new chapter of my life was about to begin and I felt that. 17 years later, we arrived to the present. Today, right now. But I still think about the place that I left. The place that I left was cold at night and hot during the day. It was filled with long, bumpy roads that my seven-year-old legs would struggle to cross whenever I needed to get to the other side. The place that I left had the smell of freshly made pozole at seven o'clock every evening as the senoras would set up their senadurias right outside of their front door in the entire block. The place that I left had my mama Eni, my grandma, giving me menudo every Thursday morning before school. That's still a place I want to return to. The place that I want to return to still has long bumpy roads, but it is now mixed in with streets that have pavement as smooth as the surface of a cake. The place that I want to return to still comes to life at night, in the evenings as the senadurias come to life and light up the entire block as the sun sets. But the place that I want to return to cannot have my mama in it giving me menudo every Thursday morning before school. I have no ancestors breathing. Saying that prods the small hole in me. Time will keep stretching and I will keep finding spaces of knowing and unknowing what this means. We give ashes to the ocean and ocean they become. A generation ebbs into death as the next one flows into forgetting. My uncle was once six years old, now dead. One winter, he lived in a shack made of chicken wire and clay. He'd poke holes in the walls to the outside. They'd yell at him, don't let the snow in. They had been sent to Wyoming, along with the other Japanese, and were trying to keep the warmth they could keep dry. I wonder if he knew the ocean then, if he missed it. My uncle talked about being a little boy there, and when I went to Heart Mountain, where my family stayed, were placed, were captured, were imprisoned, were there for only a short while, but do the braids of that time fall down my back still? As I walk toward the sea, the cool water comes and greets the edges of my mane. When I went to Heart Mountain alone, a person searching for memory. The register was thick with names, but none of them were ours. We were missing. The nation made us ghosts, and ghosts we remain. And so we make a home of the ocean.
Thank you everyone for joining me today. We are so excited to have all of you all here. Um, what brings us here together is this amazing cultural identity monologue project that we have all asked you all to be a part of and you have all created such amazing pieces. Um, we'd love to hear more about them. So if you all can just share your name and tell us a little bit about the pieces you created for this project. I'll go first. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Pablo Saldana. Um, I wrote a monologue piece called The Place That I Left. And it was kind of an homage to my journey immigrating to the United States from Mexico um, and kind of my experience when everything was so new and so fresh. So being a part of this program, this monologue program has allowed me to kind of explore that inner child experience again. Hi, I am Arielle Flynn Bolden and I wrote a piece called Black with a capital B. And um, it was kind of a love letter to my childhood, growing up black, growing up with Southern family members and just growing, growing up and discovering what black meant to me and what the world thought, what it meant to the world and how that conflicted and here where, I, where I've arrived to now. So, yeah. Hi, I'm Lisa Sanaya Bennett. Uh, I wrote a piece called Ocean Beach about uh, a few things, one of which is like a feeling of having a fragment of history. The other is um, about my family's experience uh, during World War II being in Japan. <clears throat> Hello, I am Rami El Etrebi, and uh, I wrote a piece called Longing for My Ancestors. And it was um, a piece in which I use, I connect my uh, love for fashion. Um, as uh, to my grandfather, who I never met, uh, and it was a lot of it was a lot of fun to work on. Thank you, everyone. Um, so, when creating this piece uh, or these pieces, we we asked you all to write about an aspect of your cultural identity. Um, that could mean a lot of things. That, that is such a broad topic. Uh, there are so many parts of who we are that make us unique. Um, so what was your process in choosing the stories and the experiences that you did decide to share with us? Um, what was that like? How did you get to that final moment of, yes, that's what I want to share? I think for me, I, it started with, well, I, I feel like this whole exploration started before you guys even asked because of the, the way the world is. Um, but usually I, with this, I sat down and I was like, all right, where's the truest place I could start? <laughs> and it was here, um, which is where my identity, I feel like all of our identities lie is your, true, your truth. So I, st I started there, waded through a lot of stuff, but started there. I, I was gonna say uh, for me that um, it, it, you know, sometimes there's this like life imitates art, art imitates life sort of thing happening. And when I had the opportunity to write a monologue, I know that just in my head for a while, I've been wanting to connect more to my ancestors, you know, being like a first generation um, American in this country, you know, there's this like lack there's a disconnection from, you know, the people in the past. And so it's something I've been thinking about in general in my life. And so when I have an opportunity to write something, that is what spilled out, you know? So it's kind of like Ari is saying, you kind of just write what is the most true for you in this moment. Yeah. 
Yeah, just to piggyback off of that, um, I think for me, it was similar. Like, I went back to a place where I felt very invisible. And I was, and I thought to myself, what, you know, I, what would have helped me to see, you know, on, on, on television, on the media, on something, on any platform that would help me feel seen and would help me feel like my story, my particular journey is valid. I originally started with two pieces and it was through the coaching of the Geffen Playhouse and, and Joanna Ray that I was able to actually connect the two. So then there was this kind of journey and this arc of where I started and where I, where I ended. So, so yeah, that's kind of how it all started for me. Yeah, I'm feeling what everyone's, how's my volume by the way, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, I think what everyone's saying is really resonating for me. It's interesting, Pablo, like what you're saying about what I want to hear and see. I love that. And then for this one, I feel like really aligned with Ari, what you were talking about is like, what's in here? Like, I, it's just what I've been thinking about. I've been going to the ocean a lot um, during the past six months, just driving or like really late at night finding an empty place and just being like, oh, you're still here. Um, and so, I mean, it was just in me to talk about. But when I don't have ideas, sometimes I think about like, what am I saying? Uh, what do I find myself thinking about or saying or what stories, especially culturally from the people I identify with, what are they saying? Like uh, just thinking about like the rhythm of your life and the repetitions involved. Um, that's where I go to when I, when I don't have something that's like, oh, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing to hear how your artistry, you know, your individual creative journey really meets with who you are inside. And, and that's what it sounds like is resonating from all four of you is, is just this kind of path that crosses between your artist and your artistry and your work and this like personal journey that just sounds so honest and, mm -hmm. and genuine. Um, and so now, so present, so here, which is beautiful, so beautiful, um, so real, because it, it could be tomorrow and it'll be something completely different. Um, you know, we, we could have started this project tomorrow and maybe these pieces would have been something, you know, something else. So really beautiful to honor and capture that moment that you were in at the time. Um, and on, on top of these wonderfully written pieces, you have all put together such amazingly unique performances. And, you know, it's, it's a strange time in the world where theater is not on stages and it's not in, you know, this typical platform that we have all learned and kind of been used to what theater has become. Um, and so everyone had to kind of get really creative and, and figure out how to, perform these monologues virtually and you all did something very different and you know how what inspired you to get to that final performance what inspired you to choose to perform in that way because really when you're outside of a stage the possibilities are endless so yeah how did you get to that final performance piece Um, I will say for that, for me, I was, um, you know, during this pandemic, I, I, I was probably one of the many people who started like using TikTok more. And so, um, <laughs> you know, TikTok showed me that, you know, you can really do kind of some fun stuff, you know, uh, with mm -hmm. some sharp editing, with some cool sound cues, you can like repurpose sound, you know, in a certain way. And I felt like the monologue I wrote is of course something I would love to perform live on stage, but because I don't, didn't have that opportunity and it had to be done via video, I was like, oh, I could actually tell more of the story. You know, so like in my monologue, uh, because it's a lot about, there's a little bit about fashion. I, I had an opportunity to actually change my costume multiple times, which you would not nice. normally do <laughs> on, on stage. And so that was cool. It was fun. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, like, 
this monologue can actually, you know, be very vibrant just with like a quick edit here and a, two lines in one costume, two lines in another costume, two lines in another costume. And so that was really fun to discover because I'm not, I'm not a feel a video oriented person. I'm like live theater till the day I go. Um, but maybe that's changed. Pandemic has changed all that. You know, so I've got to expand my artistry also uh, by working on this. I am to theater till the day that I go. So this <laughs> this exercise or this this project really stretched me. I could have gone further, but um, with with um, my monologue, I used a lot of alliteration, and with that, created a lot of rhythm, and it was almost like a song. So I chose to mm -hmm. use voiceover and a little bit of percussion um, with a very simple zoom in image because I felt like the monologue encapsulated this journey that I wanted to visually represent. And it was very minimal, wore white. I just wanted to have a blank canvas to kind of let the, the voiceover fly and live and, and, and exist. Um, I, I, uh, just wanted to like go to the ocean and get footage. I didn't really think about what it would look like after, but I've been really, I mean, I sort of a Luddite and then have now been like, okay, we're doing stuff online. I'm into this. Um, but also, I mean, the nature of mine is a little more spoken word. Uh, my monologue like leans into a poem and, and also in it, I talk about people as the ocean. Uh, and so that to me sort of dissolves, the ocean is for me a place that dissolves identity. And so in cutting it, I thought about what could rupture my body in the space. And honestly, I was just playing around with iMovie, like what can I do in here? And so then it was a bit of playing around and then um, ways to sort of uh, create fractures in, in thought and identity, uh, I thought matched what I was trying to say. Yeah, I think with film and, you know, and having a camera, you have endless options, right? You can definitely take the viewer to exact, the exact place, exact kind of space that you imagined. Um, for me as a, as a full-time working actor, everything has been upside down since the pandemic. So every, uh, instead of going out to auditions all the time, we've shifted into this whole self-tape kind of machine where every time we just started, we just get self-tape after self-tape. So to me, that's just, that's the mood that I am in. This is kind of the lifestyle that I have. So um, for me, I decided to take that route and to do my monologue in a self-tape setting where, you know, it's a blank backdrop with simple lights, no distraction. I did not have any props. Um, and what that allowed me to do is just to stay true and to really listen to the words and allow the words to kind of tell the story. And it just gave me more, more to play with in regards to my imagination during the performance. You know, it, there's a lot of, there are a lot of things that you all have mentioned that even I didn't even think about, you know, um, like Rami and the multiple costume changes that would have been very tricky to do on stage. Um, and using the different kinds of video editing um, that was involved in Lisa and Ari's pieces um, that would have felt and would have been done so differently on stage. Um, but because of this virtual world, uh, it, it just like really combining the different artistic elements um, and the different artistries that you are all into, whether that's fashion or, you know, film, um, editing, uh, a little bit of props and costume design and, you know, what that looks like um, in theater. It's just theater is so much more than just acting on stage. It's, it's all of the different elements and art forms that just intersect and, and build these powerful experiences. Um, can you all maybe talk a little bit about 
why you chose these artistic creative elements, um, you know, why the percussion in the background, why the spoken word, why the film, why the fashion, or, or how does that play into, you know, your artistry as, as theater makers? I don't want to speak first, but I do have an answer. Um, I'm going to speak first, I guess. Um, so uh, one thing I love about theater, ultimately, which is why I will be live theater till the day I go, is that it is it encompasses so many art forms within one. It is not just text. It is not just visuals. It's not just sound. It is really all of those coming together, dance, all of that. You know, there's just so many art forms happening simultaneously, collaboratively, telling a story. And so for me, when I wanted to, and I'll say I always advocate for very subtle storytelling. So in my piece, you know, I don't change my environment. And all I have really up behind me is this rug that, I, that, is, that is Egyptian. And I knew that that rug would tell much more of the story than I could um, because it, it, it helps set the tone and it helps talk about, you know, the land of my ancestors without me having to talk about the land of my ancestors. Just a simple rug hanging behind me told so much of the story. The fashion choices told the story. Uh, I didn't have to talk about it. It was just visually told the story. And so, um, I knew I, I'm already a big advocate that everybody that the slightest subtle a signifier a little prop a little prop can tell a story a little sound cue can tell a story it was so much fun to be able to tell my story in the simplest way possible um, and it all came together very clean in my opinion <laughs> and um, <laughs> you know who, who knows what other people think uh, but it came together really simply um, because I didn't need a lot Um, I, I think about this all the time. Someone said this about David Bowie's work. They said the medium is the message. And they were talking about the way he was, was also the, what he was saying in his songs. And so I think with theater, you get to, I mean, with many art mediums, you get to understand that the thing you are saying gets to match how you say it and how you express it. And I think that's really useful for people who aren't white. Um, because so much of how we've been saying things have, is part of colonized consciousness. And so in, in really looking at the, like the frame and the structure that we're in and how we communicate and being able to move that around is like so cool for me because these structures dictate how we think. Like the, you know, the words we have available to us affect how we see and love and feel and all that. Um, so I really loved uh, when the folks at the Geffen were like, this can be anything. Like, you know, you were really open about this. And so I got to lead um, with just like where my curiosity was, like uh, the space that I wanted to be in, um, that I wanted to share, uh, go from there. I loved, I loved that you said that because I felt that when I was creating this piece was creating it for my own gaze in mind and my own um, understanding of language, my own understanding of music, and not just my own, but people who also exist similarly to me because of, you know, skin or, um, or place of being, um, being able to use AAVE, Ebonics, African American Vernacular English, and also the percussion, which is very much so part of my culture. I grew up listening to music my like 24 hours a day and um, being able to um, tell different types of stories through different mediums. The percussion was telling a completely different story than the words were versus what the props were. It was, um, it was a very um, freeing experience to find myself in little pieces of everywhere in it. For, for myself. I'm so glad you said that. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. Um, for me, in my, in my particular piece, um, I took my 
my audience member in a journey of a span of 17 years. So for me, stripping it down just felt so right. And it felt so good for me to take my audience, you know, it just allowed me so much ease to be able to say, and now we're here and now we're there. And it just allowed me to, to essentially just strip down. You like when you go to a black box theater performance and it's just like one box in the middle of the stage. Like, I think that's just as beautiful as when you have this whole elaborate, you know, dragon on stage that's made out of, you know, like both of them have such unique stories and experiences too. And I feel like we need both, you know, we need something really elaborate just as we need something stripped down and raw. It just depends on how we're feeling. Yes, to all the things you are all saying. And, and just yes to this powerful moment of honoring the way theater exists in our lives um, as a place to express ourselves and to create and to share, to empower, to love, to you know reflect all, all of those things. Um, which I guess leads us to a really big question. What inspires you to do theater? And, and I know that that question can go on for days, especially since, you know, live theater till the end, right? Um, but I mean, even, even through now, even through this time where theater is transforming you know, and, and the world is, changing what inspires you to create to do theater i think you said it um for me i guess the biggest thing that's pointing out right now in this moment is the possibility for transformation um by experiencing it experiencing theater by in being involved with it and being and, and working with the people around. There's such a capacity for change and for visibility. And it's one of that's one of the things that keeps me going. I remember when I fell fell in love in, with theater. And if if I can aid or be a tiny little speck in that for someone else, whew, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's it's um it's uh, it's God work, I think. It's it's life work. It's yeah. Completely. I I would have to say, I do theater and I search theater because of the energy. There's something that is so magical about being being everybody everybody being on the same page, you know, anywhere from like three people where it's just like maybe to one man show, one woman show and like two crew members, or it's like a full ensemble of like a hundred people on stage. Regardless, that group of people is all working towards the same exact goal for that time. And to me, like that's just on, like it's, it's uncomparable. Like there's no I've yet to find any other places or any other experiences in my in my life, in my existence, um, where where that happens. And it's like it, the vibrations are so high. I remember even being in quarantine. One of my favorite things that I've watched has been Hamilton on Disney Disney Plus. Like, and you know, it's 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 it, it's just the energy and 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 the the I don't know, just the drive and the motor that all of those people are are having. I, totally like everything I, I think the thing I've been thinking about the word like vocation like calling I think there are reasons I give but over the course of my life those rational reasons are so different than you know when I was a teenager getting into theater and so like there's a there's like a deeper soul calling to it that it gives me lessons that I don't quite understand and will change and so um, the reason why I'm doing it right now is, is a deep love and also the celebration of um, breath in the body and that presence. So it's like you are hearing people, you are breathing with people watching, people are breathing on stage. And, and that to me is like a lifelong study of like what it is when breath meets body. 
and creates language and then creates resonance with one another? Like what happens there? Um, amen to all of that 100%. Uh, I, I would say for me, like, you know, theater is an opportunity for to, you know, see to learn some to learn something to see to see people to see culture to hear stories you know that uh one may not be exposed to otherwise and you know it's and it's a really good way to just sort of like step across the aisle uh, of for lack of a better term you know and see somebody and you know develop compassion and develop a sense of uh, understanding of you know, all the narratives that um, are out there in this world that we actually live alongside, you know, and we have to coexist with everybody, you know, and so there are, there, there are differences in privilege out there. And theater can, you know, get us to understand, you know, the other side to that. And um, there are differences in, you know, pain and struggle, and we all hold all, we all hold our own pain and struggle differently. And and like you know, Lisa was saying, how it how it sits in our body is all different. And so, uh, you know, theater allows us to show up and to understand and to collectively you know process and heal. And you know, in many ways, it, it is spiritual. It's one hundred percent spiritual work, like Ari was saying. You know, and uh, sometimes I call myself a light worker. Some people chuckle when I do that. Um, you know, I think that's I. I think that is. It's one hundred percent true. I know that I have been. I have witnessed profound change in my life due to the theater, and I know that I have helped um, create theater that has profoundly changed others. And I hope we all continue to do that because, you know, that's what we're here to do you know, to create some beauty. I, I just have to recognize the way everyone lights up when you talk about theater. And, and I think that's just, it's proof of just how impactful our individual experiences can truly be when participating, when creating, any art, you know, um, whether it's theater, whether it's yeah, dance, music, and I mean, not just performance art, if it's visual arts, it, it's just, there's some real power in the way we can take the things we love and put it into something to share, not just with ourselves, but with the rest of the world. Um, I have one more question, and I, and I think it's just, from hearing everything that you are all saying, but you know, where do we hope theater will be? Theater, theater has been changing. Um, the world is changing. There are just so many things happening. And I think it would be ridiculous not to recognize the time and place that we are in. I mean, we are doing this over a virtual space. Um, and it's just embedded in the in the way that we are now exploring our artistry. So, and I and I think Rami touched upon it a little bit in what he was saying. But where do you want to find theater in maybe the next few years? Um, and and I think that can really say a lot about the power of theater. You know, I hope, um, Jana Ray, I hope that, you know, things begin to shift. I, I don't know if like going back necessarily is the right mentality that we need to be having at this time, but having the opportunity to be in a space together with people. Um, so I definitely do hope that in the near future, we are able to have some sort of communal experience where you know, everybody's seeing something or experiencing something together. Um, but one of my biggest critiques, I think, for theater and just growing up, you know, in a, in a space where I was not 
encouraged to do theater. I was not, none of my family is in the arts um, until I came along, but um, just accessibility. Um, all of my life, I grew up just understanding that the, the going to the theater is expensive. Going to the theater, you have to dress up. Going to the theater is, you know, you have to commute there, you have to travel, you have to pay for parking. So I think um, structurally we're in a, in a time, or we have been in a time where it does limit accessibility to, to a large part of the, our communities that need to have that, or to at least know that it's there. Uh, and I know that the Geffen Playhouse does a lot of work, intentional work about reaching those communities, but yeah to me that's my biggest hope is that we can make it more accessible for people and we can make it especially for younger generations but just for anybody you know to experience something like a live performance in a space um i i think i'll keep my my hope and wish uh simple I just want to be able to get in a room or be in a room with people, like Lisa said, breathing, um, where everybody feels comfortable to be safe, <laughs> to be, feel comfortable and safe in a room with other people. Um, that's, that's my hope. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very proud and emboldened by the ways people are finding to still create with the tools that they have in front of them. I, one thing about an artist is like, you can't keep us down. We're gonna make some art if we wanna make some art. And I, I, I think that's the biggest thing that I'm taking out of this is it's not a room, art isn't di dictated by room, by money or anything, it's dictated by want. So I think, I hope that we come out of this with an even stronger want to create and include everybody in that. It's accessibility a thousand percent as well. Um, I'm like Robbie. Um, I think all of these sound great. I hope that we can respond to this time with the depth and profundity that is needed to reflect on what we're living through. I really love like how people are putting stuff out and making and I'm also concerned that it might be confused with like a capitalist desire to make, 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 go, 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 do, do, do. And I think uh, it's tricky, you know, because it's not a binary. It's not one or the other. Like, I love making a bunch. And also, I do feel like I need to make a bunch to survive. Um, but I hope that we meet the craft as artists with this a sort of radical shift in energy that I think we as a community in a greater scale need um, to really look at ourselves right now. I think we need some really foundational shifts So yes, 100% to accessibility. I think it's great, obviously, for like, because, you know, Pavel mentioned Hamilton. It is great that something like Hamilton is now accessible to millions and millions of people when it really was not, you know, and um, uh, for the highest ticket price ever. So, you know, it's, I do hope that we do move towards, you know, making theater um, not just accessible to like audiences, but as these monologues have shown that we can create theater with what we have, you know, you don't need, like you said, it doesn't need to be in a theater. You don't need to have like professional equipment. You don't need to have um, even like your, your, the text does not need to sound any certain way. It just needs to be true and honest to you if there is text. You could do theater without text altogether. And so um, this idea that theater is not just accessible to the consumer, theater is accessible to everyone as, as an artist too. You know, like you, TikTok has actually shown that we can all create content, you know, and we can all be creative and we can all be fun. And maybe, you know, um, we never saw that in ourselves. I 100% believe that everybody has the capacity to be an artist. It's not a it's not a gift that you're born with. It is something, it is a skill and talent that we all have, that maybe we all are born with. Just some are cultivated more than others. Kind of like Pablo said, similarly for me and my family, I'm the first artist to come along. 
and who knows how many artists in my ancestry were denied and suppressed, um, but not me. And I'm to break, and I'm here to break that, you know, uh, generational pattern, because um, we are all artists, and we all should be encouraged to be so. Yes. Yes. Yes to everything, y'all. I am so honored to share space with all of you and to have this moment to just hear how and why you create and do the amazing things that you all do. Um, thank you for putting together such powerful pieces and, and speaking some truth into them and, and sharing with us a little bit of you know what's inside and, and why that's inside and where you hope it's gonna go. Um, I am just so grateful that we have gotten the time to sit together and I wish it was in person. I wish we were all in the same space. And I think, you know, I hope that in the future we can come together and, and build the community in person and, and create in person, um, so much of that. But again, thank you so much. I am so grateful to you all. Um, Round of applause. I mean, this is my round of applause, but yes, thank you everyone. Y'all are so, so great.